I heard all of your presentations and I think, you know, we are all on the same wavelength, on the same page when uh, recognizing the importance of cost actions. And um, I guess what I can do from my side is give you briefly my experience as uh, someone who lives in the trenches of actual research. And I would like to tell you about the story of breakthroughs science via networking. So um, I think this is a very interesting representative story. For more than 10 years now, I've had opportunities of experience firsthand the importance of scientific networking. And some examples in this respect are uh, Compsta, which is the first cost action I co-chaired, New Compsta, which is another cost action I co-chaired, Faros, which is a cost action I, uh, I am um, working with uh, in the executive committee. And then there is an, a synergy grant, uh, which is again an, an, ex, an expression of the European sense of, uh, of, of in networking and scientific uh, synergy. So what I want to present is um, what the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration has published in 2019. That is the first image of a black hole, M87. And you know, uh, there is no way I can possibly explain this in any detail, but I'll try to give you at least a glimpse of how this was possible technically and why it is actually possible through networking. So first of all, you have to remind that black holes for any mass, black holes are the smallest objects you can produce. So you can take the earth and, and convert it into a black hole if you can squeeze it into a, a, a sphere of a radius of about one centimeters. So if you can, if you can do this you know, hypothetically in some way or form, then you have uh, produced a black hole out of our planet. Now, even if they are super massive, they are, they are very large masses, they are still minuscule when they are on the sky. And that means that if you wanna take a photo of them, you need to have the highest possible resolution, okay? Resolution is a concept we understand nowadays because we all have cell phones with resolution uh, cameras, high resolution cameras. But um, in astronomy, the resolution of an image is essentially given by two quantities. One is the wavelength at which you make an observation, and the other one is the size of the telescope you use for making uh, such an observation. So clearly, uh, this formula here explains very easily why you want a big telescope. Because if you have a large denominator, then you're going to have a very small uh, number, and so a very high resolution. And here is the idea, uh, the idea that comes from uh, the EHT and this technique, which is called BLBI, very long baseline interferometry. Essentially, the idea is to create a, a virtual radio telescope that is sensitive uh, to millimeter wavelengths. So in the formula that we used before, the numerator is now filled by radio waves, 1.3 millimeters. And at the bottom, you want intercontinental distance. So, the idea is that we have radio telescopes of modest size, 50, 30 meter telescopes scattered across the planet. And you would like to connect them in some shape or form. For instance, you want to connect one in Arizona with another one at the Hawaii. And if you are able to do this, then you have a virtual telescope, which is as large as the distance between Hawaii and Arizona, which is a few thousand kilometers. So all of a sudden, you built a huge telescope by just putting two telescopes together. Now, this sounds you know, like too easy or too, too strange to be true. Well, there is a catch, and that is, it is essential in order for this technique to work that you record the image and the time of, of arrival of the signal exactly and that is why all of these telescopes have, uh, besides very high uh, frequency res um, the receivers, also have atomic clocks. So they can record very precisely the time of arrival. And you need a lot of telescope because the Earth moves. And so some telescope will, uh, uh, will no longer see the source and then new telescopes will replace them. And this will allow us to have a window in time of a few hours, eight hours in particular, to take a picture. So these are the images that we have uh, measured, and you probably have seen them um, in 2019. You can see they are 
corresponding to four day, different days of observation, they are similar but distinct. And that's exactly what we were expecting. Um, the reason why they are similar is because uh, the, the, the object, this supermassive black hole is slightly changing, or better, the matter that is falling onto this uh, supermassive black hole is slightly changing, but not very rapidly. And that's why the image looks almost the same. It's like looking at a mountain. The mountain will not change significantly in shape over a few days. So um, how do we know that there was a black hole? Well, I am a theorist, so I can predict how a black hole would look like. But of course, my prediction are as good as my modeling. And my modeling is uncertain because I don't know exactly what are the physical conditions on this object, which is 65 million light years away from us. So the best I can do is sound all possible, pos all, all possible scenarios. And as a theorist, I can produce a lot of synthetic images. So in practice, what I do is I carry out a lot of simulations of all sorts of possible black holes and all sorts of possible um, um, images that I would be producing. And, and here are just some examples. In practice, we have produced 60,000 synthetic images, which are all physically correct and plausible, but not necessarily right. And then in this process of comparing theory with the observations, then we obtain matches like this, which are quite remarkable. On the left, you have the observations. On the right, you have the theoretical model. And now, because all is known about the theoretical model, in this way, we can also tell something about the observation. And that's how we measured the properties of MM87 star, by matching those models that, uh, by, by learning about the properties of those models that best matched the observations. And so in this way, we were able to measure the mass and convince ourselves that what we're seeing is that the shadow of a supermassive black hole of 6.5 billion uh, solar masses. By shadow, I mean the little dark region in the center of this uh, donut-like object. And the reason why there is a dark region is because light from that region cannot reach us because it's absorbed by the event horizon of the black hole. Okay, I, I don't want to take too much of your time um, and maybe answer questions if you have any. Let me tell you what are the lessons that uh, I have learned in doing this exercise. The first lesson is that breakthrough results in modern science require scientific networking. Uh, the result that I've just shown you could not have been done by a dozen researchers. It really needed the uh, critical mass of having two, 300 scientists working together at the same time, not only to collect data and to analyze it, but also to extract physical information. So if you really want to pursue the most challenging questions in physics or in any science, then you need scientific networking. However, the culture of scientific networking doesn't happen by chance. It's not that all of a sudden people become uh, excellent networkers. No, this is something that is the result of training and cooperation. And you can tell this very much. There are some students and researchers that come from a, from, from a culture of, of networking and are very easily inserted in this type of work. And other scientists that were not able, or not, that were not benefited of structures like cost that find it very difficult and they are struggling in getting into, into this environment. So the cost actions in particular um, that I worked on, on neutron stars and black holes have been a very fertile soil to produce these results. And this is an example of you know, how cost actions not necessarily you know, uh, have to do the most important or breakthrough science. You know, uh, the, 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 the results that I've, I've reported are not the results of a cost action. Nevertheless, many of the scientists in Europe who have participated to this research were part of cost actions and so have been nurtured in this culture of scientific networking. So I heard this sentence many times uh, in your, in your uh, 
presentations. And yes, cost actions are bottom up structures. And this is the most important thing to us. And this needs to be preserved. We scientists, we think we know best what is important, what is the most exciting question to answer. And that is why it's essential that certain research areas or which research areas to research, uh, these are left to the scientists to decide and so that they can set the priorities. And my last statement is about the fact, and maybe you don't appreciate it, but being a, a scientist and, and, and having to interact in the HT with uh, Asian colleagues and American colleagues and South American colleagues, um, I feel particularly privileged because of this European model of cost action. This is something that doesn't exist, not even in very advanced uh, system like the United States. So everybody envies us this tool that they don't have. And we should therefore keep it, nurture it and sustain it and even increase in the funding in the future. And with this, I will stop. So long life to cost and thank you for the invitation.